Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm pitching this uh, on behalf of Ella. This was her idea. So th the title of this is Building a Community of Community. A I can't even say it. A Community of Communities. So the idea is that if you're trying to build a community, this is quite hard and it's difficult for small groups to get off the ground. And even when it does, it's hard to get to keep the momentum going once it's running. And a lot of small groups struggle with the same issues and a lot of the solutions can benefit the wider community. So instead of trying to reinvent the wheel every time, we were thinking, is there a way that community leaders can avoid feeling isolated and share knowledge and provide support across all these different communities? Um, as well as that, there might be some small communities who are working in similar areas who are not aware of each other. So could we form a large community that provides opportunities for community leaders within that to network, collaborate and support each other. So as a solution, we've come up with the catchy title of build a community of communities. So that will provide support for community leaders and opportunities for collaboration. So just as a starting point, this could be a simple web presence, so a website or a GitHub repo or a Slack group. And the idea behind that would be to facilitate linking and communication between those communities um and bringing together bringing together groups to support each other's community building so they could be sharing tips and resources and avoiding duplication of efforts providing support and solidarity and having conversations that can lead to collaboration uh, we've noted down here that building a community is hard so we anticipate that building a community of communities will also be hard um so we we want to have a conversation ideally with community leaders or people who have already worked in the community building space about how we could build that kind of thing. Um, so while we don't necessarily need people with strong coding backgrounds, if there are people who have experience in that kind of thing would be great. Um, we just want to know as well if there's interest in this idea uh, and what members of such a community would want or need from it. Um, I think that's pretty much it. So yeah, come and have a chat if it's something that interests you. Great to hear from you. Thanks. This is now working? Yeah. Okay. I hope. Uh, remote people, please, um, please shout. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat. So if I see something pinging up, if you can't hear us properly, please um, do let us know. Um, but yeah, that was the first pitch. Thank you so much. And uh, now on to pitch Clover, um, Janetta, where... Uh... Here I am. Oh, I didn't see the microphone. I'm, I'm clearly like... You know, brain, brain, and all the connections, and the brain half stopped working. Um, yeah. Um, go. Okay, you'll just have to tell me when the three minutes are up. I don't know where the time is. Um, okay, so um, the, the this project is uh, building a mini HPC for the use of uh, carpentry training or other types of training. Um, so just about exactly a year ago, when the with the previous collaborations workshop, I started building this uh, mini HPC because uh, we ran an intro to HPC workshop and everything that could potentially go wrong did. If you've ever tried to run an HPC workshop, you'll, you'll probably get, have an idea what can go wrong. Uh, apart from struggles with the internet, nobody can log on, somebody's running something on the uh, login node and things won't work. And uh, half the people didn't register account names for themselves before time. And it's not like you can create a user just on that day. So um, we thought the mini HPC is a way of uh, overcoming all these problems. You have full control over it. You can give people access on the day. It also makes the hardware less abstract for, for the actual users because most people just know about this HPC. It's something that you know some uh sci-fi sci concept uh big computer somewhere in the sky uh but with the mini hpc they can actually see what it is because we build it from raspberry pis um we've literally got one there in the box there next to sadie and i've got one upstairs um so we'll be able to try and work on these things so when it's taken me a year to get to the point where it now runs 
and it, uh, you can actually run something on it. Because although there are many of these little mini HPCs on the internet, if you follow the instructions, you'll find most of the instructions are out of date. They just don't work anymore. And it, you need quite a bit of technical knowledge and know-how. And the idea is to get this to a point where just a normal user instructor will be able to build a mini HPC with the hardware uh, and um, run the workshops. How much time do I have left? <laughs> Still a minute. Sorry? <laughs> Almost a minute. <laughs> okay. So you can you can keep talking, but you don't have to use the full okay. time. So um yeah, so the idea is to um script uh everything that has to do with installation, document everything. So for remote people, they will also be able to uh, help with the documentation of uh of everything. The lessons the carpentry's lessons need to be adapted to use the mini HPC. And uh, we also need to still add access point f functionality to the login node so that people don't even have to need, won't have need to have access to the internet to do any of this. And um, yes, I think that's about it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, next pitch that's um, going to be coming up then is about a parliamentary education census. And I just remembered that I do have a timer here, so I can just do that. Uh, Pressure. Is this working? Right. Is this? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Stuart. Um, so I'm proposing a kind of slightly different project. Um, I don't really like the name. So one of the things we'd have to do is come up with a better name, but effectively, what I'm really interested in is the educational background of the 650 MPs that we have um, in the UK Houses of Parliament. If you have a look around online, there's lots of open data about MPs, but it predominantly focuses on what they do now in terms of what they've voted on and you know when they've spoken in the House and things like that. And it's very, very hard to actually find out you know, what their background or their kind of level of expertise or knowledge on a particular subject might be. Um, as many of you probably know, um, the UK university sector is in a bit of a crisis at the moment. So we've got over 50 institutions are currently going through redundancies. Um, and one of the ways that I see of uh, attempting to push back on that is to attempt to build coalitions of university staff, like many of us, politicians um, and other stakeholders and funders and policymakers to actually advocate for the value of institutions. So what we need to do is find out which politicians are affiliated with institutions. So we can take a pretty good stab at it by just randomly assigning Oxford or Cambridge to most of them. But there's no easy way currently without kind of just grinding through things manually to say, okay, let's find all the politicians that worked at Warwick at some point or sort of studied at Warwick and then bring them all together to do things. So that's what I want to do. I want to build that data set. Um, this has a lot of kind of knock-on benefits as well, because we can start to just analyze that data set once we have it and find out things like, you know, what subjects are politicians most likely to have studied? Do we have many people that are working in with environmental briefs that actually have environmental training? Things like that. Um, you know, we know the answers to some of these. Um, but so effectively, there's two parts to this project. One is building the data set. I have some uh, really brittle code I've pulled together that scrapes everything from uh, Wikipedia. Um, and there's also people kind of frantically writing uh, in the document very confusingly, um, talking about using Wikidata as well. So part of the project is kind of, you know, data scraping, data processing, building up this database. One of the fun challenges is going to be taking sentence fragments that contain things like might politicians studied politics at the University of Ed Edinburgh graduating with a 2-1 and parsing out those pieces of information. And I'm running out of time. So I'm looking for people that you know have kind of data science interest, but as well as kind of web dev interest um, in terms of once we have this data, can we make it publicly available and visible and playable with? Thank you. Amazing. Oh. This actually does make a noise. I did not realize. Right. Wonderful. Uh, next pitch, Evergreen. Uh, Robin has the microphone. And are you ready to go? Yes. Waiting for me to start. Yes. Okay. Um, 
so a problem that's as old as SSI and collaborations workshops, um, how do we best support researchers to write better software? Um, so there are lots of resources around for researchers. We have the Turing Way, we have the Carpentries, we have various things like that. But a lot of them are either very linear, you've got to start at the beginning and kind of follow through, or you can pick out chapters and read the whole thing, or the Carpentries. All of these things are quite heavy. And quite often, I find that researchers are coming to me with just simple questions like, how do I make sure that my software is correct? Oh, uh, you mentioned something about sharing it. How do I share my software? There's lots of little different techniques that you can do to share your software to make sure it's correct. And I thought what would be a good idea is making that into a stack of cards. So there are categories that answer those questions. So you have a question like, how do I share my software? There are a series of cards in that category with information on like, you put it on GitHub, you, you create a DOI for it, you create a readme. And the, the structure of these would simply be that on the front of the card, it is an idea and a concept and a reasoning why. And on the back is a language agnostic description of how you would go about doing that, potentially with links to further information online. Um, originally we'd create these cards as digital ones because that's nice, but I think keeping to a deck of cards idea limits you to not putting too much information in there and being something that people can pick up and quickly flick through and go, actually, what are the ways I could share and things like that. So the aim is to create that. Uh, what we need is people who are skilled at using research software so that we can grab together all these sort of ideas, but people who are using research software but don't consider themselves skilled at it because that's the target audience so i need help with that um but also anyone that can add a bit of artistic flair to it would be helpful because they need to be pretty and to grab people's attention and also anyone with a bit of web development skills because it's going to be web-based to begin with at least so yeah that's what we need Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Eli, uh, Pitch Fern, um, are you ready to unmute and pitch that yourself? Is anyone in the room taking over? I can. Uh, I'm here. Okay. Timer's coming. Go yep. ahead. Um, yeah. So this idea is around creating an AI code of conduct um, a set of guidelines for how, if and how to use uh, generative AI tools at events like Collaborations Workshop, RSCCon, and other events in sort of research software space. Um, the motivation for this is that use of generative AI is pretty lawless at the moment. Some people are very comfortable doing it, some people are very uncomfortable doing it. Um, and when you come together with lots of different people to collaborate on stuff, um, that discussion is difficult to have sometimes and sometimes people just go ahead and use AI tools and ask permission or consent later. Um, I've had some personal uh, negative experiences where that has happened and then it's kind of shifted the tone for the rest of the session because the draft that we generated with chat GPT um, on the spur of the moment ended up putting sort of this artificial positive veneer over some really negative and emotionally difficult discussions that we'd had during the session that should have been feeding into the blog post we were trying to write. Um, and it was only afterwards that we realized that had happened. Um, so yeah, I really think there needs to be some sort of community driven um, guidance on how to approach using AI tools at events. Um, so if you have opinions, uh, this would be a great project for you to join if you have opinions about um, how to how to approach this issue. I don't think there will be too much technical work involved. It's a sort of a policy focused project. So if you don't want to do technical stuff, this is a good one for you as well. Um, and yeah, so the aim would be to answer questions like, should everyone in a group need to consent before um, if you're going to use AI to generate a draft um, for a blog post, or should presenters be disclosing when they've used AI to generate materials they're using in their presentation? Um, 
there's some work that's gone on already from other communities, such as there's guidance that exists for universities and civil servants and a few other places. Um, but I haven't seen anything that exists with an events focus yet. Maybe it's out there um, already. But yeah, so it's just an idea to pull together um, the different bits of guidance that already exist and try to create something that can be used going forward at events like this to just reduce the amount of discomfort and potential harm that comes from use of these tools and make sure everyone's more on the same page about how we want to approach this. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, next pitch, uh, uh, Ginkgo, which is Aniara over there. Um, timer is on. Go ahead. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is to have a online form to inquire at IRCs about how old is their computers and how often they had been replaced. Uh, so the main idea is you have uh, uh, generally even small idea of how is the impact that we have on the environment and that was motivated with all the discussions. Uh, so the requirements was you have people that are interested on the topic and uh, we could prepare the uh, first version of the survey tonight and then tomorrow we could try to get uh, promoted on RSC Slack and try to get a few numbers to present at the end of the hack day. But uh, I need to disclose that I probably will try to join the mini HPC project. <laughs> uh, but there's other people in the discussion. Uh, the idea can be taken by anyone that wants to lead if there's any enough people interest. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next pitch will be interesting as well because I think it will be one of the judges pitching something to be picked up by people in the room. So, uh, yo, are you? I'm ready. ready. Go. Corrupt judge here, folks. Uh, <laughs> so um, I know that at least one person in the collaboration, I, collaborative idea group was interested in possibly pitching this for the hack day, but I didn't, didn't see it in the list when I joined just now. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just pitch it. Worst case, go to Stuart's group instead. Uh, <laughs> um, but what we talked about in our discussion ideas was the fact that um, we care about policy change. We care about making the world better, right? Um, and like Cass was commenting, you know, we shouldn't have to wait until someone is affected very personally by the problem before we start to care. Um, but writing papers probably won't change the world, uh, irritatingly, irritatingly. So what do we do as researchers to actually make things change? Why are you laughing at me, Sarah? Okay. 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 <laughs> um, all right. Fully distracted. So we, our idea was 10 simple rules to influence 10 different types of people. So that might be a school kid. It might be a politician. It might be your vice chancellor. Um, but the idea being that if you enact any one of those rules that you have in some way approached a person that you want to help ch change the world. Um, I think Cass was interested in taking this and I don't know if she's online. So if I've just stolen your thunder, I'm sorry. The end. I don't see her on the list, but this is a um, you know a good reminder that while we are kicking things off, um, there are uh, still it is um, late in the day. So especially for remote folks who might have family at home, um, they're not or their ability to follow along with um, this is limited. So um, keep yeah. keep uh, eyes and uh, ears and rooms and groups open for uh, folks joining tomorrow morning when um, the work day starts for them again. Um, but that means we are now on to uh, pitch Juniper, which is Paddy and uh, ready with a mic. Good to go. 
<laughs> just what? Yep. Um, so I didn't actually write this down, but uh, if I'm assuming it's referring to what we talked about earlier in the idea session. So uh, we had a few different ideas. I'm not sure it'd be a bit ambitious to do all of them, um, but essentially we're trying to think of like, how can we kind of come up with a set of standards that uh, would aid in green computing? So uh, someone proposed like a, like a PEP8 type system. So if, you, if you're familiar with Python, Python has a set of opinionated standards called PEP. I can't what it stands for, but we'd think of a similar kind of thing. So, you know, a bunch of like, this is what we think you should do. Some of these could be practical, like, so for example, get actions uh, by default, if you, let's say you have an hour long test and then you realize halfway through, you've got a bug and you fix it that hour long test will still run and then you'll have another hour long test. But there is like a, this concurrency option, which you can then set so that it would cancel the first one. So little things like that. So that good example would be like an easy practical thing. Other things could be, I mean, they'd be harder to set in stone, but things like, you know, don't use nested for loops and things like that. Um, now extension of that was, um, if anyone's familiar with rough, which is a Python formatter inspired by black and other things. They've got a very good website that has rules that are like, you know, for example, let's say we had green zero zero one, and it would say an example of like, here is bad code. This is why it's bad in terms of impact. And then here's a proposal. What's the better option? Um, so yeah, one thing would be like making a static website with some rules. Obviously this is like a never ending process, but we can at least get that ball rolling. Um, further ideas from that. And this is where it starts to get more ambitious. So black, which I mentioned earlier is a Python formatter, very popular. Um, and that runs stuff automatically. One thing where you can make a similar thing called green that would, um, you know, make green improvements to your code. Now that might not be trivial, but it'd be nice to automate some of this stuff if possible. Um, there was further idea, which I think would not be possible tomorrow would be some kind of like co-pilot type integration that would be like. Have you considered this suggestion to make your code greener? Uh, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's all those kind of ideas. Um, but the simplest one is a website that has some kind of set of standards that we would kind of suggest and whatever. So yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. And, and for people that uh, don't want to look it up, like the chat uh, has been smart and apparently pap stands for python enhancement proposal so if you were wondering um there's your answer um right next pitch uh kelp if i'm yeah i'm still on the in the right order on the list um jazz uh do you have a microphone i do not <laughs> uh right Apologies. Um, we're I'm subverting the order of running. Subvert People are putting things, claiming spots that I'm messing with uh, with us, but Mwah. ready to go? Y yeah. Generally not. We'll see how it goes. So this came out of the collaborative ideas session um and was proposed initially by sarah over there who is a judge and cannot partake um so we had a discussion about how mental health is an issue and it's systemic and uh there are a lot of books and systems and things like that for, for managing your tasks and managing your time to be more productive um and we wanted to flip that round and sort of pick out our favorite um task management tips uh to instead be for defending your time and defending your energy and for being about self-care. So the proposal was to put together a carpentry style course or something like that, um, that introduced people to um, these kinds of resources, but um, put a gloss on them of self-care. Um, 
And we, we, the guiding principles we came up with were task management for self-care, not for organizational productivity. Um, different approaches work for different people. There's no one way. Explicitly address inclusivity and privilege. Uh, make sure that neurodiversity and disability perspectives are included. Uh, acknowledge the lack of diversity in the group of people who produce these kinds of frameworks and that no strategy is a valid strategy as in not having not choo choosing not to have a strategy is a valid strategy gosh that's a sentence that's hard to um so we are looking for people with an interest in um mental health and or productivity systems um people who would like to write about said things, people who have some experience of um, putting up uh, the infrastructure to uh, create a website, uh, carpentry style or otherwise about those things, um, and generally have a discussion about the pros and cons uh, of different ways of organizing your time. I'm just going to remain silent for the final few seconds. Thank you. Right, on to the last few pictures if people, well, people are still adding at the bottom, so we might go uh, a little bit past um, seven o'clock. Uh, Samantha and uh, making runtime run. Yeah, so this came out of the session earlier. So. The environmental impacts of software are mostly invisible and we want people to be able to see and feel them in a tangible way. Um, so I'm a big fan of experiential and game-based learning. And one of the biggest things we find is with research computing is that people are physically disconnected from what is required to do their work with computing, the cost of manufacturing the hardware, creating the software and so on is, is pretty much invisible. So we wanted to make that visible to people. So the pitch is we want to make an app and we want the facilitation materials to go with it as a learning resource to help represent that physical manifestation of, of what is required for that compute via a scavenger hunt. So we want to help connect participants with the different types of environmental and social impacts of research and computing through the actions that they choose. So it's a mass participation thing. So it's designed to be used with groups of researchers or students taking them through a computational, a series of tasks that are required to get the computational work that they want to do to run. I'm literally reading this off the thing because I otherwise I'm going to lose the plot, representing the different types of, of resource required, highlighting some of those that may not be well known, and provide a tangible representation of the impacts on people, society and the environment. Yay! So the app enables the facilitator to run the activity by providing a user interface to distribute tasks to the participants using game-based learning techniques in the form of a scavenger hunt to find the resources required. So it's going to be a game, so we're going to need an app, we're going to need people to help with UI UX, and people to help write the facilitation documentation, please. And some graphic design skills, or we can just take CCO things off Pixabay, but that is also an option. Thank you. Um, the next pitch uh, on my list is, uh, uh, and I'll move you over so people in the room are, uh, can see you, Alexander. So, um, yeah, it's coming from remote collaborative translation setup. Go whenever you are ready. Okay, hope you are. You can hear me, right? So, I would like to suggest something around uh, collaborative translation, and something is really formulated very vague, and it will depend on what the team will be interested. So this is a common topic, uh, gather together a group who is interested in setting up something. And then what that something could be? It could be setting up a translation project of your choice. And we can look what suits better, either TransFX or crowding, for example, infrastructure. Uh, for example, for carpentries, crowding is better, but carpentries is using paid subscription, so your mileage may vary if you are using the free version. Um, so this is one opportunity. And uh, another one is to look at another carpentries project as well, which is called Glossario. 
And Glossario is a pro multilingual glossary for computing and data science uh, terms. It is based on GitHub. All text is there. It is contained in YAML files. So for both project and principle, there is no programming experience required. And I would say that even if you can help us with setting up tools and just study functionality, you can only speak English. You don't even have to don't necessarily to be a bilingual or multilingual. So Glossario in principle, this is very straightforward. There is already a contributing guide and there is simply nothing to set up. Just start the project of translating things and populating it possibly with new language. And there are some languages which are heavily translated and some which are just uh, started. Uh, it might be also interesting to look at opportunities to build something from the library because Glossario is not just a resource like a website. It is also a library which can be used in Python, I think, and it may be interesting to connect it to some other translating projects, maybe like Carpentries to help to populate glossaries in tools like uh, Transifex or Crowdin from that uh, from from Glossaria to ensure that your translations are consistent and so on. So looking at that could possibly be useful to get the, to learn how to contribute to Glossaria and be an advocate on this project if you are interested to build further community around it in your own language. So please like talk to me. I hope I gave an overview of possible things which can be done. And then let's try to shape this further together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right, next pitch, uh, Oscar. Uh... Yes, I'm here hidden. hiding behind the screen, so sorry, <laughs> go. Yeah, so um, the idea that we're trying to pitch is about bridging the arts and humanities and sciences or tech, uh, including the creative industries, to promote the exchange of ideas and uh, increase collaboration between the three domains. And um, the problem that we're trying to solve is that researchers may want to use creative methods uh, for co-creation or collaboration but lack the knowledge or methods on how to do so. Um, and additionally, from the other side, uh, artists want to enter conversations into the use and adoption of technologies, um, but are often excluded from essential conversations. So it might be a, a side hustle, but some artists really want to engage on a substantial level with these um, discussions. Um, and um, the solution of, of how to solve that problem is um, the creation of a handbook um, with uh, creative methods that uh, RSCs can use to look for um, methods and um, examples. Um, and where, on the other hand, artists can also contribute um, their ideas, um, they put their contact details in, um, and maybe so in that way sort of start conversations. Um, so the idea there is really um, a handbook for guidance and inspiration to cover ideas, suggestions of co-creation using arts and creative methods to showcasing and communicating technical issues in the RSE or sustainable software field. Um, and um, the idea is that by showcasing creative approaches to engagement and communication by collaborating with artists, we can encourage those working in the RSE field to explore different and perhaps more out of the box approaches. Um, RSC can engage with their creative side interests since a lot of RSCs have creative hobbies, backgrounds, and jobs. And the arts in particular are underrepresented in the RSC domain, so hopefully this could encourage more engagement from the arts sector. Um, so what we are looking for initially is uh, probably people um, with an interest in this. You can be from the arts, but you can be from the RSC community as well. Um, we're looking for people with technical skills of creating the handbook, which will probably happen in Markdown and um, will sort of be an, an open resource. Um, and then finally, that handbook might have also a place or a website or something, a hub where artists and uh, RCs and people from creative industries can meet and see each other's 
uh, projects and ideas. So that's the pitch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Almost there, three more to go. Um, David and Replimat. This thing on? Okay, cool. Um, hi everyone, I'm, I'm David um, and I, I hate MATLAB. Um, it's, maybe a, <laughs> it's maybe a little bit strong. I have got the, uh, the logo on here and on my laptop, but I haven't gone to the extent of tattooing it on myself quite yet. Um, Replimat uh, is a, a tool that I have not finished yet. This is some ideas have come from the discussions. This one came from a fellowship that I haven't finished yet. Um, and Replimat is a, a resource uh, that is designed to mitigate the uh, difficulty of reproducibility and sustainability in MATLAB projects. This is because researchers like myself in the past and many in the present uh, do use MATLAB uh, for better or for worse. Um, and it is possible to make those projects reproducible. Um, I found it out the hard way um, and it is possible. It's not as easy as in some other uh, situations, um, but I want to help researchers to take those projects that already exist and make them reproducible because I've had the same comment said to me so many times, which is I must get around to rewriting this in Python. Um, and whilst that may be a great thing to do, I doubt that most people will get around to rewriting their old projects in Python and will just maybe write a new one, which is a great, great idea too, but the old ones can also be reproducible. So uh, Replimat is a, uh, it's a book built in Quarto, so it's a website, uh, it's a reference manual, it's a, a workshop uh, with a set of exercises that are sort of partially developed or mostly developed um, for people to follow. Um, and learn about how to do uh, good things in general, but specifically in MATLAB because those resources just do not exist. It's not a very popular language among RSEs, even if it is among researchers. Um, so uh, this is, I, I should say that MATLAB is a proprietary language. It's a commercial product, uh, which is part of the, the issue. All the folks at Mat MathWorks who develop MATLAB are wonderful people and they're all trying, trying their best. Um, but that does, uh, have its difficulties. I am not in the pocket of MathWorks, that should be said, and I. this is for the, the, the benefit of research itself and for the researchers, not for lining the pockets of a commercial organization. Um, sorts of things we can do on Hack Day are anything that anybody fancies, and I, certainly ideas that I don't have, those are the ones I'm the most interested in. Um, uh, we can uh, do some uh, beta testing of some of the exercises, we can do some proofreading, uh, we can generate some things that I can work on myself or with others in the future. Um, if you want to go and work on something else, I totally get it. Um, but if you want to take one for the team, uh, come and help me out with uh, with Rep from that. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, next pitch, Sadie. Um, um, hi, is that working? Um, yeah, I, excellent. I should Thank be. you. Um, okay, so my pitch, um, which is called uh, Visualization S in um, parentheses, could be one or more, uh, of the health or status of software or of the RSE community. Um, so the idea is uh, to design and build um, at least a proof of concept for a visualization or a set of those, which would encapsulate um, the health or the status of either um, a given piece of software, some arbitrary piece of software, or of the RC community. Um, so, for example, the aim could be to represent and showcase one or more aspects of sustainability of software. Um, for example, the fairness, the openness, greenness, um, reproducibility, um, one or more of those. Or it could indicate the, um, the status of the community as a whole. Um, so, for example, its size and history or its diversity. Um, so there's lots of potential ideas under that umbrella, um, and of course we'd want to focus in on on something a bit more concrete, but that's the general idea, um, and that was inspired by the climate stripes or the warming stripes, um, which are a simple visualization which highlights um, rising global temperatures on Earth uh, year by year as a stripe, um, which I hope people are familiar with, if not, um, there is a link on my uh, document. Um, I guess the idea with these visualizations showcase in a easy, easily digestible way the improvement in um, the health and sustainability of software or the community, um, or at least to encourage improvement uh, there. 
Um, I guess there's two main challenges that I see. Um, the first is to find appropriate metrics to show with the visualizations. Um, and that is hopefully how we can build an existing work. Because I know there's a lot of work going towards quantifying various aspects of sustainability um, and then to decide on a good way to visualize those. Um, so who would be a good fit for the team? Um, so anyone, um, first of all, with an interest in data visualization and graphics and representing information to contribute to the ideas and design uh, and or anyone with a knowledge of quantifying um, any aspect of the sustainability of software or, or the health or status of a community um, to help us choose what information to uh, capture and Finally, um, and or anyone with technical or coding abilities to actually create this this visual, uh, visualization or set of them um, based on on the above um, design and information choices. Um, so I'm not sure what tool we we could use. Um, I guess it depends on what team may form if there's enough people interested. Um, yeah, thank you. Hi. Yeah. So I'll try to make this quick and painless. I know everyone's held up. Oh, go. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. It's the last one. Uh, so I think uh, I, I am not somebody who's actually uh, ever formally had an RSC position. So I might be different from a lot of people here in terms of like not knowing what I'm doing here. So, <laughs> but one thing that I frequently had problems with working in a lot of academic labs, it's like uh, there's a great cool staff of like RSC folks trying to help us, us trying to like get some support. But uh, I think the process of that communication where you're trying to say that like, oh, you know, I'd like to have this oceanographic modeling thing and I'm not sure like what kind of a package I want and whatever you are trying to communicate to software engineers or uh, whatever, when they, when they tell you that, okay, you know, this is not feasible, like, oh yeah, this is, this is not happening in three months. Like just how do you even start thinking about those standards? Uh, sort of a more like, I think in spirit, the way you have more standardized templates or some things, a sort of a mental checklist where you can be like, okay, you know, this is what's feasible, this is what's not. And uh, I mean, a lot of this comes from like, I really like documentation. Yeah, that's a problem. So I, I think it's great when things are super formalized, right? Like autism, it's great. Like I know exactly what I need to check instead of this fuzzy stuff about, okay, we don't know what can be done, what cannot be done. So even things like, if you've made a very super niche package, there are probably parts of it that could just be, you know, scripts that can be made open source that other people in similar areas could use. And I think nobody has any idea how, I mean, maybe people have ideas actually, or people have done this before and these things exist. But I think uh, as a broader theme, this is something that has often bothered me on like both sides, being on both sides, although I was never formally on one of the sites. So I don't know. I, I'm just very curious to hear if other people are really mad about this and we can be mad about it together in a room. So let me know. Thank you, Thank you so much.